So I wanted to first take a look at Latin America in the 20th century. Now, Latin America is not one of the regions that is quote unquote decolonizing during this time period. Um, Latin American independence was secured um, during the Atlantic revolutions in the late 1700s, early 1800s. However, Latin America does see quite a bit of the common characteristics that you see of decolonization during this time period. And they closely resemble a lot of the areas um, of decolonization in the 20th century in terms of uh, lack of economic independence, um, political turnover, these sorts of things. So we're going to take a closer look at Latin America during this time period. Um, so like I said, Latin America sees a lot of political turmoil in the 20th century. Most of this is based around questions of class, social class. And a lot of that stems from the lack of economic development in Latin America. Um, the majority of this uh, economic development being held back comes from um, the hundreds of years of colonization and mercantilism under the Spanish. Now, <clears throat> during World War I, Latin America sees a massive economic surge. Um, they provide many of the raw materials and most of the food production for the warring sides in World War I. But just like the rest of the world in the 1920s and 1930s, there is a massive economic downturn during the Great Depression. So after World War II, fearing yet another depression, many of these democratic states in Latin America pursue what we call protectionist economic policy meaning that they look to protect their markets from the influence of the global trade market, uh, meaning that they want to protect their businesses, they want to protect their own industries. So one of the things that they do is they start putting in place very high tariffs um, on foreign imported goods. Now, high tariffs is a wonderful thing if you have your own strong manufacturing base, meaning that as long as you can produce enough goods domestically and at reasonable prices domestically to satisfy the demand of your population, well, then you'll be fine. Um, high tariffs won't have that massive of, of an effect on you. However, in Latin America, that manufacturing base does not exist in the 1940s and 1950s in the 1960s, which means that not only do the prices of foreign imported goods go up, the cost of living goes up, um, consumer goods are in relatively short supply. And what happens is that in times of economic turmoil, when the cost of living goes up and the cost of consumer goods goes up, the middle and the working classes are the ones that suffer um, much more significantly than the upper classes. And so while domestic corporations and domestic businesses um, are doing incredibly well in Latin America, the poor and the middle class are suffering dramatically. Um, unemployment, um, homelessness begins to spread. And similar to what you see in the 18th century in Western Europe, is you see this massive rush of urbanization as millions and millions of Latin Americans move out of the countryside where they can no longer afford to live and farm strictly for their own sustenance. Um, they move to cities um, and this creates a massive housing shortage. Um, it completely overwhelms the infrastructure in many major cities. And you see the development of these incredibly large slums in um, major Latin American cities. Uh, the best and most well-known example of this are what's known as the favelas in uh, Brazil. Um, these are incredibly large, what could probably just be described as shanty towns, um, small residential houses, usually only a single story or multiple stories built very quickly and um, under very little regulation. 
And just like during the early years of industrialization, you'll have multiple families living in these, you know, single room units, um, very little infrastructure, very little running water, um, you know, waste, waste, uh, not waste reduction, uh, waste removal is a massive problem. Um, you see, you know, areas where trash isn't picked up for weeks or months at a time. Um, you know, some places with no indoor plumbing, you know, again, similar to what we saw in the early years of industrialization. Now, here is the issue with this is similar to as in the 18th century, democratic governments are rather slow to respond to this growing economic crisis among the lower and the middle classes. And in the 20th century, you see a lot of political turnover. Um, just like during the French Revolution in 1789, when the government is unwilling or unable to um, equalize the economic situation or the social um, situation by reducing privileges or by providing economic stimulus, people are not going to stand for this for very long. So many governments in Latin America are overthrown either by their people or in a lot of cases by their own militaries on behalf of the people. Um, this leads to a surge in communism in Latin America in communist groups and political parties. Um, however, the most significant trend that you see in Latin America is the development of these military dictatorships under what's known as caudillos. So these caudillos are generally a military officer who is able to seize power and then use the force of the military to develop a dictatorship over a number of years. Usually this leads to um, the decline, you know, a decline in human constitutional rights. Um, most of these governments are extremely oppressive of their own people. Uh, the best example of this, the most well-known example of this is Augusto Pinochet in Chile. Um, Chile, sorry. Uh, he and his dictatorship um, terrorized the Chilean people for decades um, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and much of it with the support of the West and specifically the United States. Um, because again, in the 60s and 70s, you could easily get your hands on American money and American weapons as long as you promise to fight communism within your own country. Um, now, obviously, this creates a lot of anti-U.S. sentiment in much of the population. Um, at the same time, the oppressive nature of the government creates a massive flow of immigration north from Latin America to the United States and Canada to escape the living conditions and the violence in these countries. And that is a trend that we still see um, all the way up until the modern day. So this map kind of gives you an idea of um, the political instability in some of these Latin American countries um, in the 20th century. Um, this map shows the civil war that raged for several years in Nicaragua between bleh, between what's known as the Sandinista government, uh, which was a socialist group that had taken control of Nicaragua, and they were opposed by what's known as the Nicaraguan Democratic Front or the Contras. And this was yet another example of um, Cold War meddling. This actually became a massive controversy in the 1980s. Um, if you want to Google um, General Oliver North and his testimony before Congress. But essentially what the United States did is that it funded the Contras in Nicaragua and their fight against the Sandinista socialist government um, through the sale of weapons and drugs um, in and outside of the United States. Now, as we said, a lot of these military strongmen, a lot of these caudillos depend on financial support from foreign governments. Um, obviously, the Soviet Union and the United States being, you know, the two big suppliers. But in return for that military and financial support, um, especially the governments that are supported by the United States, 
Um, in return, they need they are basically pressured into reopening their countries to the global marketplace um, by lowering tariffs, by allowing foreign investment by U.S. companies. And the process of this kind of willing mercantilism begins all over again. Um, these countries begin exporting their raw materials to the more developed countries. And in return, they purchase cheap consumer goods from across seas. Now, this solves one economic problem. This eases the shortages of consumer goods in many of these countries. The cost of living starts to go down. However, what it does is because these uh, military dictatorships completely and thoroughly throw open the doors to Western investment, this as we've talked about many times before, um, ravages domestic industries and domestic businesses. You know, whenever Walmart comes to town, mom and pop, you know, mom and pop businesses tend to shut their doors. So the shortages that you see in Latin America in the 60s, 70s, and 80s are pretty soon replaced by. Um, more unemployment because the government is simply, like I said, throwing open the doors to foreign investment and foreign governments. Now, because of their inability to deal with the economic problems and to close the income gap between the upper classes, mainly, um, mainly even in the 20th century, these are still Creole families. Um, while the middle and the working classes are still mainly mestizo and Native American families. Um, and this social structure goes all the way back to the Costa system during colonization. Um, on top of that, you also have a massive breakdown uh, within many of these countries. Um, government corruption leads to the misuse of public funds. You have overspending on the military basic public services break down, schools, hospitals close, roads become irreparable, running water and clean drinking water becomes a, a massive problem in a lot of states. And people begin to turn against these military dictatorships, which for the most part usually respond with violence and oppression. And what ends up happening is the pressure internally from their own population combined with external pressure from the rest of the world, as well as the fact that in the 90s, after the Cold War dies down, the West, including the United States, really has no need to support these oppressive dictatorships anymore. So the combination of internal and external pressure um, causes a lot of these military dictatorships to crumble. And in the 90s in Latin America, you see this massive sweep of democratic victories across Latin America where new democratic governments are installed, new constitutions are written, and things return somewhat to the stability um, of the early part of the 20th century. Now, economically, Latin America is still dealing with the after effects of mercantilism. Um, low literacy rates, low levels of technical education, low levels of higher education, um, a very weak manufacturing sector in a lot of these countries. Um, however, it is slowly building. A lot of it is due to foreign investment on behalf of groups like the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, Western corporations. But there is still a relatively large gap between the quote unquote industrialized or first world countries and most of Latin America. So here you have some pictures uh, from Chile in the 70s um, where you can see that the military is being used directly in the streets to break up protesters, to arrest political opponents. Um, Pinochet, the, uh, the leader of uh, this military dictatorship, was well known for putting to death pretty much any political opponents that he came across um, and ended up either arresting, torturing, or murdering somewhere in the range of 
two to three hundred thousand of his own people. 